introduce and I will ask the first question was I always said before. And now we are live on Facebook. Okay. Well, well, welcome everybody. Uh, we'll, we'll wait for a few minutes, allow a few more people to gather. I, I think we still have about three minutes. So if there's three minutes of thin air, so be it. <laughs> Ben, are you out? You, you can't be outside. Are you outside? People always think that because uh -huh. I think it used to be uh, a porch, but they glassed it in. So I'll show you. I'll give you the reverse view. Oh, okay. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, but that's, that doesn't sound, I mean, that doesn't look very warm still. There's no insulation. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's actually not bad. I mean, oh. it doesn't look warm because, because Indiana's weather from like <laughs> November to like March is depression. Um, so, um, you know, I feel like it, that's like where I am too. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like constant charcoal skies and, uh, uh -huh. yeah. So I, I, I feel like just the light is cold, but my, but my body is actually okay. So, oh, okay. Okay. Well, the weather reports for sunshine tomorrow. So oh, we, yeah, we need lots too. of sun. Sun, sun always sun. makes me feel better. Even but, if it's uh, cold. Ben's, uh, Ben's, uh, Sons have not had enough snow for real good sledding this year. It's true. <laughs> Although I did my, uh, I was trying to teach my class as like the kids were coming home and my David won second in the science fair. So score for us, um, you know, we did, I, we did talk about how we could sabotage the other kids projects ahead of time. I don't know if he, he did that, if that contributed, but the physics of mountain biking jumps. All of the, all of your kids do the mountain biking? Uh, well, John, the little one, not yet, but he wants mm -hmm. to do, he wants to do everything his brothers are doing. So like oh. if there's a little wood jump that we've built, like John will like walk over it and like kind of crawl over the other edge and see it, you know, and he'll, even in his little balance bike without pedals, he'll try to do it. So yeah, the big two are super into it. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's exciting. Thank you so much for you guys coming in to do this for me. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. And so many postcards. Okay, <laughs> that about that. Says, says hi to Ben and Grace. Okay. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you for joining and all the other folks that are joining in. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, and me too. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, yeah. We can the chat. Where's the chat? Oh, yeah, there's Stephanie. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, Stephanie asks a good question just as we're about to start out. And the question is uh, Are the attendees uh, visible to uh, the panelists? And the answer is no. Panelists can just see each other. But we're so delighted that you're here. Welcome to this uh, this uh, uh, talk, and uh, we are also monitoring the uh, the chat box. Um, so um, so even though we can't see your wonderful faces, uh, we can see your um, your uh, chat. Uh, uh, you know so. Uh, that is a good place to put in your questions, uh, and uh, we will be monitoring that and uh, and uh, asking questions in the chat box. So, uh, just to get started, um, I will would like to uh, introduce my wonderful colleague uh, Grace Beeson Kim, uh, who uh, is a professor of theology at Earlham School of Religion, and. She's an ordained minister in the Presbyterian Church USA. Um, so uh, the um, uh, and uh, today we're uh, uh, we're asking questions about her newest book. It's so exciting to have it fresh off the press, called "Hope in This Disarray: Piecing Our Lives uh, Together in Faith." What an exciting title, Grace. We're so excited for this book. It's, it's uh, published by uh, Pilgrim Press. 
Um, anything else you want to say about the, uh, the book public publication for today? Yeah. So anyway, thank you everyone for joining me. This is the cover, Hope and Disarray, um, uh, published by Pilgrim Press. And believe it or not, my first book, um, The Grace of Sophia, came out 2002. And that was published by Pilgrim Press. So it was really nice. Uh, Pilgrim Press two, uh, published two of my books, so my first book and then my latest book. So Hope and Disarray. So it's very exciting. The staff is different, but it was just so wonderful to work with them. They're a UCC, I believe, um, publishing house. And they may be one of the oldest um, publishing houses in the US. So they've stuck around for a while and I'm just thrilled to have my latest book published um, through them and they were just wonderful to work with. And I'm sure some of them are listening right now. So I just want to thank my editor, Rachel, and all the staff, Karen, and everyone else that helped me bring this book uh, into the world. You know, this, uh, people got sick. So um, Rachel, the editor got sick while this was happening. And then when it was near the end, then I got sick. <laughs> so a lot of things happened in 2020 and, so I'm just thrilled that it's finally out and people can read it either in print or as ebook. And because I was sick, you know, our first um, book discussion was actually booked in October and then it got moved to November and December and we, I wasn't still well. So I'm just thrilled that um, I can do it today in January. And thank you so much, Steve and Ben, for uh, joining me today and asking me questions and engaging with me in this topic. And thank you for everyone else who's um, joining me in this um, webinar. And I look forward to answering some of your questions as you raise them. So um, I will ask the first question, then I'll pass it to Ben uh, for the uh, second question. And then uh, we will do a mix. If there are questions in the chat box, we'll ask those. If not, uh, Ben and I, I'm sure, have more questions. Um, Be nice to me, ask, both of you. <laughs> I, I'm going to, to ask a uh, question at the start that I think is pretty obvious, Grace, uh, at least it was to me. Uh, and uh, yeah, my jump off point is our pages uh, 14 uh, to 15, the, the, the paragraph at the bottom of that page, um, where you, uh, you talk about uh, church services and uh, you know, uh, whether they're live or whether they're being uh, put online. And you say, we may be glimpsing into a promising future of the church through democratized access of church services for the unable and curious, yet we cannot deny that it stifles agency to engage in a physical space of worship and the natural fellowship that follows. Thus, we must remind ourselves of the virtue and essentialism of attending service. And, uh, you know, so uh, my thought immediately on reading that was, maybe that was written before the pandemic, so, um, you know, I, I just was, I'm just inviting you to reflect on the experience that we've all been through in the past year, uh, pandemic-wise, which obviously has meant for many a lot more online worship, uh, and uh, whether it's changed your thoughts in that way or, or, you know, I presume much of this book um, was uh, written before the pandemic, or at least conceived, so more broadly, I'm just interested in, you know, where do you find hope in time of a pandemic when we're all kind of isolated from each other? And it's great to, to see you on the screen, you know, but, uh, but uh, whether we're faculty colleagues or students or alumni or, you know, we're, we're not um, socializing a lot in person these days. Yeah, thank you for raising that uh, very important question. So bulk of it was written and conceived before the pandemic. A few things were written um, as the pandemic was, uh, we were in the middle of it. But this piece was written before the pandemic, the one that I'm talking, that you referenced to about church. So it's interesting because I was saying how important it is to have the face-to-face. -face. And then we're hit with this pandemic. And I know some churches uh, met face-to-face. -face. Um, I know like my dad, um, 
he was worshiping and, and having Bible study face to face. And then the pastor got COVID. So, you know, things like this was happening. And, and I know the desire for people to meet. So when the pandemic happened and I wasn't going physically into a building, I actually welcomed the change. I thought, this is really nice. I can just worship in pajamas or in the comfort of my home. Don't have to waste gas and go somewhere. And I welcomed it. But now, almost a year later, I just feel like um, there has to, you know, I think it's great that we have Zoom. It's great that we have all this technology. You can turn it on and it, everything's at your fingertips. You can turn it on and off. I think that's a great thing for us living today. But there's something about being human that we need that human touch. And now, you know, now in January, I'm thinking, I don't know how I'm living and how everyone else is living. I think we've lost the sense of being together and it is very lonely. You know, I still have a um, husband and kids in the house, so it's less lonely, but I, I imagine some folks who are elderly or young folks, it is really getting hard. Today, I saw something on the statistics of young um, youth committing suicide because there isn't that connection. And so school boards around the US are really uh, thinking twice about should we go uh, in person or not because of this disconnect. So, you know, I think it's wonderful that we have um, different ways of worshiping without the face to face. But I think many of us are now yearning, you know, I you know, because I think we're created as social beings, God created and, and put us together. So I think the socialness of being church is um, lost and it breaks people's hearts. And I think it's really hard and it's getting hard on me. So I think if it's hard on me, it must be hard on others. And then just to say beyond the church, I think um, school and seminary life too, I think it's getting hard, this isolation um, for maybe single folks and even with family and other friends and partners. It, I think we do uh, long for this connectedness beyond the web. I think the physical touch uh, we desire. And so I, I kind of am excited that we can be church in various ways and I'm longing for it when we can get back together and um, worship and greet one another. I know when the meme of Bernie went along, it was just spreading and I got involved too. But I thought the funniest one, which I found among Presbyterians was, um, you know, the picture of Bernie and how uh, Presbyterians behave in a re Pentecostal revival service. You know, we don't want to touch people. We don't want to interact. And um, you know, as Presbyterians, we can laugh about it because that's how we are. We just want to be isolated. But I think now we've come to a time that we're going to look forward to greeting one another and shaking one another's hand and even hugging one another, even as those Presbyterian. So I'm glad you raised that. And I think it really opens doors. And if if those who are in the webinar have questions and other comments, I welcome that too. So Steve, thank you for raising that right from the beginning and the importance, I think, you know, church is just, you know, we've always talked about, it's not just the building, it's beyond that. So part of it is the community and the fellowship. And I think we really, really, really now are longing in after all these months of being in isolation. Um, so just a brief reminder, uh, please put your questions in the chat box. We will ask them, I promise. And now I pass it over to Ben. Sure, yeah. I, you know, I didn't put the timing of it together until we started talking, but um, uh, it's kind of remarkable timing to, re to release a book called Hope and Disarray after the pandemic of 2020 and not to have intended that, and not even after the pandemic, during the pandemic uh, 2020 into 2021. And then, you know, it's kind of a perfect fit for the times. Um, I want to like kind of give you a chance to just for for people who haven't had a chance to look for the book look at the book to kind of just kind of give us a you know a big picture um 
I'll say for others, the, the book you call them, I think like there's, there's sort of a collection of shorter pieces that are uh, theological journaling or theological meditations, you call them, and that's divided into three sections, living in church, living in culture, and living in relationship. But these, these collections of shorter meditations. So um, I believe this is your 19th book. So this, this, this ain't your first rodeo. Uh, tell us like why you wrote this one. Um, who you hope will read it, and how do you hope they'll use it? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. You guys are both asking me really excellent questions, so thank you for that question. Um, as I mentioned before, um, this is my 19th, and the first book was published by Pilgrim Press, The Grace of Sophia, and then this is also published by Pilgrim Press. And it was kind of by accident that it got published by Pilgrim Press. I was just emailing them about, um, getting a PDF file of my Grace of Sophia. And then they contacted me and said, oh, you know, we're going back to publishing. So they had halted publishing for a while. And I think they were just doing church resources. And now they're only publishing a few books a year. So I said, oh, you are? I said, I'm kind of finishing up this <laughs> manuscript. So then I sent it off. So it was kind of maybe divine intervention. I don't know how it was, but it was great that it worked that way because I had a great, you know, thinking back, um, it was 2002 when Grace of Sophia came out. So almost 19 years ago, is it? I don't know. I can't even count years mm -hmm. now. I get my decades strong. I remember the first time when um, the editor, Michael, called me and said, they're going to publish it. I said, oh, I was thrilled. And then this time around too, because I was kind of finishing it off and I didn't know what to do with it. And when they kind of said, where they're back into publishing books, I was really thrilled. So, you know, my earlier books are very academic, except for maybe Grace of Sophia wasn't as, you know, it's kind of in between churchy and academic. But then after those books, um, you know, Holy Spirit Chi and the other, Colonialism Han and, and, the transformative spirit. Many books, I don't know, five or six after that were heavily academic. And then I, as I was writing them, I thought maybe I shouldn't write so many academic books because it's such a narrow um, audience, right? You write them and, you know, libraries order it, but then you don't reach as many people and then people use it for a paper or, you know, they don't read the whole thing. They just go for what they need and then that's it. So that reason and a few others, I thought maybe I should just write more for the general audience, which I enjoy. And around that time I was blogging. So I started blogging and writing for different areas like Huffington Post and I don't know, Sojourners and other places. So I thought this, then I can reach more people. You know, both of them are just as much work anyway. So at least, uh, for the general public, at least more people are going to read them and I could have a bigger impact. You know, you live so long and my, my thought always is, how can I impact? How can my life be impactful? Um, how many people can I reach out? So that's always in the back of my mind. And last fall when I was ill, I thought maybe this is it. Every time I get seriously ill and hospitalized, I always think this may be it. And then is that all I did? Uh, with the life that was I was given. So uh, before I wrote this one, I wrote another book called Contemplations from the Heart, and it's very similar. And that was published by Wiffenstock. So Contemplations from the Heart, I think it came out, I don't know, seven years ago. And when people, when that came out, people, you know, strangers emailed and said that it was very touching and it really helped them. So that's what I like when just strangers and people who just by chance find it on Amazon or another bookstore, another website or at the library and they read it and they find how uh, impactful that was. And, you know, one person then invited me to that, you know, there were many people who did that, but the one person then invited me to Budapest and I was there two years ago to speak. So things like that happen. So this one, I really, you know, they're theological pieces and um, Ben, as you said, divided into three sections, and each of them uh, begin with a scriptural passage. And I did that purposely because I remember when I was like, I uh, finished my PhD in theology, people always criticized theologians saying, you know, you never read scripture, right? You just... <laughs> 
a friend of mine who's a church historian said, you know, church historians, we have our documents, biblical scholars, uh, we have our Bibles. And then he said, you theologians have nothing and you guys just make everything up. <laughs> there may be a little bit of truth in it. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, I don't think I make everything up. There. You know, a lot of us are biblical theologians too, uh, or historical theologians, or church theologians. So anyway, I begin each one purposely with a scriptural passage as a starting point. And then these pieces run, I don't know, three to five pages, and then end with a question. So Ben, you asked, you know, what's, what's the intent? So I'm hoping, and you know, it came out in December. It was actually supposed to come out last June. And then, as I said, our editor got ill. And then so all this delay, just one thing after another. And then I got sick too. So it just came out a month ago. People had already emailed me and said how they're using it as a devotional book. And that's kind of my intention too. And um, people contacting me and saying how impactful it was and, um, making them think differently in different ways, even with the scriptural passage that they may have read, you know, all their life. So that's kind of what I hoped for. And when people contact me, strangers, and tell me that, I'm just thrilled because that's what I'm always hoping for when I write either a short piece or a book or an article. So it does end with questions. So if you're reading it by yourself, you can just ask them or reflect on them. And the other intent was that I was hoping that church groups will read them together, either um, youth group, you know, because they're written really simply. So other youth groups can uh, use it as a study group thing or adult Bible study or other groups of people who are interested or just among friends that they can meet together. I think um, there's 28 pieces. I can't remember. Um, I think I submitted 28 and then the editor wanted 30 and then I gave third, I added a few more and then somehow they got added to other pieces. So I think it's an odd number. I think it's 28 altogether in here. So you can use it as a monthly thing or once a month thing. So I'm hoping that that will happen and I'm hoping that people uh, will be challenged or maybe they will challenge me and then I might write a third one. <laughs> like this so that's kind of my intent and I hope people and I'm hoping students will read it too you know Earlham College uh, we have it in our library so and you can get it as an ebook so I'm hoping that people read it and be challenged or challenge me from um, what they have gleaned from the book well Thomas from Wichita along the lines as uh, along the lines that you've been sharing Grace, as a temporary answer for lack of socialization here in Wichita, um, uh, uh, in the churches in Wichita has been to meet in very small groups so that uh, you can still uh, have social distance, uh, but also have spiritual motives for meeting. Uh, and uh, maybe churches like those in Wichita could use your book, Hope Among Disarray, uh, chapters from that book uh, as a uh, start for sharing or prayer. Uh, yeah, so I yeah. think that's very much along the lines of. of yeah. So I about. hope, yeah, that um, Thomas, as you mentioned, I hope uh, perhaps your group, as long as people are doing it responsibly, um, meeting together, social distancing and, and wearing masks, etc., then, you know, keeping your distance. I think this will be great for small groups like that to get together and, and, and either read it together in that setting or read it uh, in advance and then come together. So I'm hoping that, and, you know, as people are getting the vaccine and, you know, Biden said by summer, we should have heard it immunity, then, you know, we can get back together and meet in very small groups and then maybe larger groups by summer. And so I would love it when, if churches and other small groups use it. And I always love to hear back from those who use it. So if there was something that challenged or maybe something that they want me to cover next time, those are always good ideas for me. So I would love feedback. So thank you for your comment. Yeah. Grace, uh, one of the uh, one of you, your major concerns has been climate change, and you've written whole books about that. But 
it does pop up in a few chapters here. Um, and, uh, I, you know, this is a sort of a separate observation, but um, not all of your uh, chapters actually have the word hope in them. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, the reader has to kind of discern for herself or, or him, himself uh, where, uh, where the hope is. Um, you know, and yeah, and yeah, as I was kind of observing that, I noticed that you were also tackling a lot of very challenging um, subjects like climate change, you know, uh, you know, which there, you know, been world gatherings for decades now, but, you know, the most, you know, kind of scientists think we're, uh, you know, humanity is falling short and what we're need, really needing to do to, to um, you know, slow the warming of this planet. Um, so, you know, in dealing with questions like climate change, which you address in the book and which you've addressed in other books, where do you find hope? Well, you know, where, where, if you were uh, to write the word hope in, in, those, uh, in those chapters, where would it, where would it fit? Gonna, so. Forgive me while I, while I change locations to a better plug-in spot. So. Okay, yeah, yeah. Don't I mean, let your computer die on me. <laughs> I won't, I won't. Yeah, so that's another great question. Um, yes, I do deal with climate change. And, you know, the, the original title, there's only a handful of my books where the publisher accepted the title that I gave them. And this is not one of them. I think the original title I submitted was Hope for a Hopeless World. I think that's what it was. And then they changed it to hope in disarray. And I know, um, you know, just before the inauguration, you know, the, the news headlines were world in disarray. So I thought, okay, great. My book just fits right into this whole how we find our, our world in the present uh, time. So I actually, when the editor, the publisher, suggested the title. I thought, this is great. I like this title. And I liked uh, the subtitle, which is Piecing Our Lives Together in Faith. I don't remember if I even had a subtitle or whatever it was that I gave them. But I know the original was something like Hope in a Hopeless World. So that's where I was coming from. This world, you know, as Christians, we are called to hope. You know, we are called to love, peace, and hope, and faith. So this hope, you know, it's something... You know, the world is, is in disarray. There's climate change happening. There's um, racial injustice, sexism, homophobia. There's so many problems in the world. And I think as Christians, we can't just sit there and say, oh, that's it. You know, there's no hope. You know, climate change is happening. Are we going to just sit there and go, okay, that's it? Or um, say, I, there's nothing I can do about it. For me, with hope, it's not just being this... It, for a Christian, for a spiritual sense of hope, it's not this understanding of, of optimism. Oh, I'm optimistic that we're going to, this climate change uh, will stop and the world will not get warmer, um, the pollution will decrease, the um, greenhouse effect will go away. You know, those are, you know, we're, hope is not about being optimistic. I think non-spiritual people are optimistic, you know, or people of just without recognizing faith in their life will be optimistic. I think for me, when I was writing this, it, hope is more than optimism. It is this clinging on to God um, and trying to stir our spiritual being in our lives and Hope in itself does not end there, but hope leads us to do something. So that's why I write about these different topics in this book, because optimism can just end there. I can just be optimistic just in my mind, but with hope, it stirs us to do something. And so when we see this climate change happening, you know, I think many of us in America are in denial. You know, it's not happening. It's a fake. We're not going to believe in the scientists where, you know, like 98%, majority of the scientists agree. 
And this is one of the few topics that scientists ever agree on. So when you have all this data showing, we see the effects of this, then we got to do something. And I think as people of faith, as individuals, and as communities of faith, and as churches and seminaries, we need to do something. So that's what the book is trying to do that it's not just clinging on to this optimistic feeling oh you know oh my i'll just spread out this optimism in my life it's beyond that it's really hope is it stirs us to do some action which is social justice action so you know i have those many pieces on climate uh, justice things and i you know i'm part of the a working group for the World Council of Churches on Climate Change. And, you know, we are hoping, and I think some churches are doing this better. So I think the European churches are way ahead of North American churches, you know, in here in the U.S., half of us are in denial anyway. And then the other half, we're a bit slow. You know, we're the second biggest polluters um, in the world, second largest polluters as a country. So, and we just continue to pollute and pollute and we got to, and so the great thing with Biden now is he wants to go back into the Paris Agreement. So, you know, most of the world have agreed um, to be part of the Paris Agreement so we can lower our carbon footprint, the carbon um, monoxide um, into the air, all the pollution we got to decrease. So I'm glad we're going to go back in there and do our part. Uh, as the second largest polluter in the world. So, you know, that's the hope that we cling into as people of faith, as spiritual people, as, as spiritual beings on this journey of faith and this walk that we hold together um, as community, that we will do something about it. And I'm hoping, you know, Earlham School Religion will be more active in this climate change issue. Um, and those who are listening from around the world uh, through Facebook Live or in this webinar, that we will all kind of work together and live in this hope that really motivates us and changes us to do something. Yeah, thanks. I mean, that we got into one of my first questions too, which is that hope means something particular for you. It's kind of like this, it, it, it's a context, it's like the background the background uh, through which we, we act and take action and that justifies and makes sense of taking action. Um, yeah, so yeah, that was, uh, and you talk about us an anchor too. Uh -huh. an anchor. Yeah, so yeah, I do use the image of anchor. And I can't remember if I used it or Mitri. So I, I forgot to mention. So the foreword is written by Mitri uh, Rehab who teaches in Palestine, in Bethlehem. And then uh, afterward by Elizabeth Henson Hasty. And she teaches at, I think, B Butler University in Kentucky. So, um, and I can't remember who used the anchor. I think I used it, but you I could it. be wrong. So I, I, I used it, okay, used. <laughs> thank you. Because I've been ill. I can't even remember what I did in the morning sometimes. So thank you for verifying that I, I used it. Yeah, I, mean, I, now, said now, it, I couldn't remember if. No, I think that's it myself. But, um, <laughs> you know, but um, one of the things that I wanted to just, just signal to folks who haven't read it and, and maybe ask you to talk about was, um, like, I feel like I got to know you better from reading this because uh, there's lots of personal anecdotes in the book because it's a meditation, it's a series of meditations that often moves between life and memory and theological reflection. And, uh, and so I got, it includes these sort of vignettes, um, yeah. you know, from, from your life. Um, and, uh, I, and I, and I almost kind of want to ask you to, to talk about some of them and how your sense of hope was forged and affected, you know, by and through them. Like I was struck by, a lot of the memories of childhood. Um, for example, you spent an extraordinary amount of time going to church when you were a kid, <laughs> right? Um, and I just give people, that's the one I was kind of thought might be fun to talk about, but I mean, uh -huh. Osho fashion magazines were some of your first, you know, literature effectively. Um, you were taught to fear North Koreans might kidnap you in the night. You were a fan of Ripley's Believe It or Not. Um, you know, you could say, you went to, uh, you, one of the churches you went to was Pentecostal and you didn't quite know what to make of it first. Um, so uh, I, I guess tell, yeah. 
tell us about bringing that in. And I'm particularly <laughs> interested in how that, tell us about that childhood of going to multiple churches weekly, it seemed like, uh, uh, became, helped make you the sort of person who, who writes a book about hope. Yeah. So thank you for reminding me about how much, you know, sometimes I'm thinking maybe I share too much and then I'm thinking, no, I'm, I still consider myself private, but then in my books, I'm way more open than I may be in, in real life. Um, but I think because when I teach theology, I always tell students, uh, theology is biography and biography is theology. We come to know God through our own life experiences. So Ben and Steve, your life is different from my life. Although uh, listeners in the webinar, you know, your life is different from my life. But even if we have these differences, there's also similarities. And one of the exercises I I asked my intro students to do is this theological reflection paper. It's just like three to five pages, but they have to pick an experience from their life and then reflect and find God in there. Because I think everywhere, everything that we do, we find God. Um, I think, you know, we, we teach that a lot at Earlham School of Religion as, as what Quakers believe too. So that in that way, I bring so much of my life into my books. And particularly when it comes to more of the churchy or the more uh, general audience, uh, less so in the academic, though it does still come in the academic pieces. But my, you know, going specifically into the church, you know, I was born in Korea and we immigrated in 1975. And if you look at many of the immigrants, particularly Korean immigrants, the way to survive for us was to go to church. So we were never Christians in Korea. We converted um, to Christianity after our immigration. And first it was just me and my sister who went because it was a great break for my parents, you know, get them out of the house. And then later they realized how great church was and then, and then they came along with us. And then they realized, so that was a Korean church we were attending. You know, and as young immigrants, or me and my sister, we were young kids, our English wasn't great. And our parents couldn't teach us because their English was even worse than our, our English. So the only English that we were getting is just picking it up at school, you know, in our English classes, grammar classes, and so forth. But it was still not great. So my dad, you know, you know Koreans are all into education. So they thought, okay, we'll take them uh, and plot them into these different churches because the great for my parents I'm they won't admit it but I'm sure it was free English classes and free babysitting for them so I you know they would plop us and we went to this missionary alliance church on Friday nights the youth group there and then on you know we had um, Korean language school on Saturday morning so we had to go to Korean language school then Saturday morning I went to this Baptist church for Sunday school then in the afternoon we went to the Korean church and then Sunday evening we went to another different Baptist church I don't even know what I don't remember these Baptist church names but that Sunday evening that was back then when we had Sunday worship so that was a worship service so and then, you know, that was a regular thing. And then once in a while, there was other Wednesday services or Wednesday gathering. There were just so many gatherings. And then on top of that, then they would take us to these revival services. I grew up in London, but they would either drive two and a half hours to Detroit or two and a half hours to, to, to Toronto. And it was a whole weekend of revival services. So that, you know, I had, it was so much church for me. And, you know, it was fun because you get to play around and have fun. So a lot of my reflection on the Holy Spirit come from those revival services that I attended and being scared of what was happening because I didn't know what was happening. And then so now raising my kids, you know, they're older and then now the pandemic is happening. You know, we're not going anywhere. But before the pandemic and my youngest, you know, all my kids have a hard time getting up particularly Sunday morning. And I remember him saying, I would wake him up and then I said, hurry up and you know, get ready for church. And he'll say, he'll look up to me half asleep and he'll say, again? 
And I said, again, what do you mean again? This is our first worship service. He goes, yeah, but we went last week. So, you know, what a difference. You know, I went so many times a week and I never said again. And then there's this one guy going once a week at the most. <laughs> then he's saying to me again. So, you know, a lot has happened from my childhood to my kid's childhood. But, you know, I, I bring in these stories because I come to understand God and understand God's presence in my life, either through my childhood. And some of these um, stories are probably some recent ones too, from my uh, meetings on climate change and some of my teaching experiences. So yeah, that's why I bring so much of my own life. And then I do that and I make my students do it. I know some of them like to do that assignment. I know some of them don't, and some of them never get why I asked them. But if they're listening today, or if they listen later on, that's part of the reason. I try to explain it, but, you know, so that's what happens. But thank you, Ben, for reminding me of how much I bring into these stories. And so I would love to hear people's response to my personal reflection on my stories as an immigrant child. Yeah. We, uh, we have a couple of questions in the uh, chat box, and uh, you, they, they sort of touch on that, Grace. So I'm just oh, okay. going to, to ask questions from our participants. Uh, one uh, participant asks, uh, thank you, or thank you, and express a question of gratitude. Thank you for sharing so honestly about sexual assault. You allowed yourself to be vulnerable, and that opens up hope for me on those issues. So she's asking you to reflect a bit more. Uh, and the specific question is, uh, what, if any, second thoughts uh, do you have about sharing so honestly? Um, I really don't have that much second thoughts. But I know um, when I wrote about um, sexual assault, and um, I'm kind of in the middle of another project on sexual assault. So that's another bigger project. And so um, consulting some people there and, and trying to get more stories from women who um, experience sexual assault. You know, it's the, the rate is really high. It's just some of us don't want to talk about it. And so um, when I reflected, particularly as an Asian woman, you know, the honor shame aspect of uh, you're not supposed to talk about it or are, uh, area of dirty laundry, your dirty, you know, your family dirty laundry, or anything that happens to you that brings shame to you, or members of your family, your immediate family, or extended family. It's a very big no no in the Asian community and also here in the Asian American community. So, yes, it's very big vulnerability for me. And I think one, I keep saying, I'm going to write a whole thing about vulnerability, a whole book, but I, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to that. But I think. Um, I think when we become vulnerable, I think it helps other people to open up and recognize how our particular experience is not so particular that other people have had it. Uh, when I um, wrote that piece uh, for a general audience on sexual assault, and I reflected on um, Connie Chung. Connie Chung actually uh, emailed me, which was so weird to me because when we immigrated to um, Canada, my parents could barely speak English, but my mom would come home and turn on the radio, I mean, turn on the TV and watch Connie Chung because she was an anchor. I forget which, it was NBC or somewhere. And my mom couldn't even understand English very well, but it, for her, it was so important for her to watch an Asian woman on TV. So I just remember watching Connie Chung and I told her and she said that that was so important that I shared that with her as we shared our thoughts through email that um, because, you know, near her, the end of her kind of um, journalistic career, it got pretty, it wasn't that nice when she was ending because other, you know, it, it of all the things that happen and people want the limelight and, you know, they kind of pushed her aside. So she, she really thanked me that um, she, she made impact in the Asian American community 
back then she wasn't so concerned about the Asian American community, but as she gets older, she is concerned. So I thought, you know, all these, I just adore her. I've never met her in person, but I would love to. But these things open up and I think it's important for us to be vulnerable and share. Connie Chung shared about her sexual assault experience and she said it was very difficult for her to share, but she shared. And then that opens doors for other people to share and so that we can build a more just society. That these things are not acceptable either in the white community, the Hispanic, the black, or Asian American or Native American community. These things are not acceptable. So we need to do something about it. We need to speak out and, and, and make a fuss so that it will stop eventually. So that's the hope that I have, you know, when I share my vulnerability um, that we um, can eventually work for more just society um, and sexual assault, uh, discrimination, sexual violence. Uh, another question, Grace. Uh, what practices nurture hope for you, uh, such as in this time of illness that you've been experiencing? What nurtures hope? Yeah. Um, what, pra no, what, what practices? What oh, what practices? What practices nurture yeah. hope for you? So um, recently, because of my illness, I wrote a piece for spirituality and health on rest and Sabbath. You know, for some of us, who just like to keep ourselves busy. And I always tell my kids, keep yourself busy, <laughs> don't waste time. It's with that kind of mentality, it's hard for us to take a break. I was forced to take a break because I was so sick, I couldn't do anything. A lot of it, illness was with my head and my vision and my ability to move. I couldn't move very well. So in that way, I was forced. So, but that gave me um, pause that I really need to rest more at the Sabbath, you know, and I think about God, you know, and the Genesis story and on this, on the seventh day, God rested. This divine, this, this omnipotent, uh, omniscient God rested. I think, you know, we read that as childhood and, you know, we reflect on it and wow, God rested, then why can't I rest? You know, we're in this go, go, go thing. Ben has young kids, just keeping him busy. And I've gone through that. And I was and so sympathetic towards Ben because that was one of the hardest times in my life too. Raising young kids, it's not that easy. So, you know, and older adults, you know, we have aging parents or aging spouses or something. It's hard and we want, so I think, Get, uh, taking Sabbath and resting, I think is a good spiritual practice. I think prayer is another one that gives us hope. So those are, the, I think, the individual things that I want to keep practicing. I think no one is really good at this, but we try our best to do it. You know, and no one's a great writer. We just keep our best. We try our best to keep writing and doing stuff. I think none of us are great teachers. We just do our best and give our best to do what we're doing. So I think that's what gives hope that, you know, in our spiritual beings that still hope grounds us, anchors us, and that God's presence and is in our lives. And I think we have to probably wrap up soon. So anyway, there might be a last minute question or something. Yeah, I was gonna give you the, the option that we talked about going for 45. Um, you have uh, been, as you say, resting and recuperating. So uh, do you feel, are you good with another question or should we? Yeah, one more question, I'll be good. Yeah, thank okay. you. Well, I'll ask, you know, it's really kind of a follow up to, to something you said earlier. I'd written it down, but it, it fits. And one of the ways you frame hope is as kind of this, like, like I said, it's kind of an, a larger orientation of life that issues in action. But it also, but another aspect of that was that it, what impinges on it is often fear, I think, in, in this book. And, you know, you talk a lot about uh, fear as, uh, you know, it's, it could be of loss of, of disappointing people from, you know, more conservative aspects of Korean culture, of not being uh, the perfect combination of super mom and scholar, um, you know, or even of like dealing with uh, a North Korean North Koreans, or there's a scene where you, you, you visit the North Korean ambassador, I believe. Um, and so you, you, 
I think your response to fear seems to be, you, you talk about vulnerability. Um, and I guess, um, tell us how those things fit together for you, like fear, vulnerability, and hope. I yeah. sense that those are crucial terms for you. And I'm just, I, I'm curious exactly how you, you'd fit them together. Yeah. So I think um, anyone who has experienced sexual assault, um, you know, violent racism, violent sexism, violent homophobia, all those things live in fear. So there is this fear that people live in. And so I want to give hope for those who do um, live in fear that this is very common. Um, that, but that's not to diminish anyone's fear. But in that fear still, I think hope grounds us and God, um, God's presence is felt in our lives. And once we recognize God's presence in our life, I think that drives away some of that fear. I don't know if I'm making sense. So the quick example is when I had to meet the uh, unofficial North Korean ambassador to the UN, I was very afraid because I was always taught to be fearful of North Koreans. Um, that was a thing that South Koreans had told young kids in school everywhere. It's things that parents teach you that the North Koreans are going to come and kill you and, and do bad things to you. So, you know, up to the second I met, um, the North Korean ambassador, it was a meeting, a planned meeting to discuss Kenneth Day, who was a, a prisoner in North Korea to get his release. Up to that second, I was in so much fear. I was shaking and I thought, they know my email. They know my phone number because I was in conversation with them before the physical meeting. They know where I live. They know who probably my family is. They're going to come and kill all of us. So that was, in, you know, that was a big fear. But once I met him, shook his hand, I realized, yes, they could be enemies. They may be our enemy, but also God said to love your enemies, right? Scriptural, that's very scriptural to love your enemies and to recognize that we are all still created by God. Somehow, even the greatest enemy, the one that we hate the most today is still somehow created in God's image. And that just brought a different perspective to me and has changed me in how I view enemy or the enemy or the American enemy, you know, the U.S. American uh, enemy. That still, you know, we become vulnerable, but I think in our vulnerability, we allow God's presence in our lives. And I think that really changes how we view the enemy, how we view each other, and how we view the world. So that's my hope for the book. As you read some of my personal anecdotes and my reflection and my understanding of the scriptural passages, that it will fill your life with a bit of hope and that it will um, give you a bit of peace and um, some change to work for change in this world. So thank you both Steve and Ben for asking me these questions and thank you for all the listeners in the webinar and I thank you for all the questions from the webinar participants. Thank you so much. Thank you Earl for this opportunity to discuss the book. I wish it was in person, but this is great too. So thank you. Thank you to Kristen for organizing it too. Yeah, and thanks to, uh, to Grace and Steve and Kristen um, the book is Hope and Disarray, Grace's Nightly Book. Grace, hold it up, let us get a look at it. Yeah. Available now wherever you buy books. So, um, yeah, thank you, Grace, for the conversation. And um, unless I am forgetting something, I believe that concludes this book talk. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And we hope to see all of you again in person soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. See you, everybody. Bye.